Hello and welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. Today we continue our verse by verse study through the book of Psalms and we come to Psalm 37. And today we pick up our study in verse 20. This is a Psalm of David, a prayer of David. And Father, we ask that you would add your blessing to the word that we're about to study. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 37, verse 20. But the wicked perish. The enemies of the Lord are like the glory of the pastures. They vanish. They, like smoke, they vanish away. God compares the wicked to the glory of the pastures. A farmer's field is nice and green in July here in Wisconsin, but don't be fooled because if you've been here you know a few months later it's going to be brown and dead. And God compares the wicked to a farmer's field. The wicked may look like they are flourishing, but they will soon be dry and lifeless. They will not go on forever. 21. The wicked borrows and cannot pay back, but the righteous is generous and gives. A bad person borrows and doesn't return it, which is sin. Meanwhile, the righteous gives what he never borrowed in the first place. So, he does not keep what belongs to another, he actually gives what belongs to him. 22. For those blessed by the Lord shall possess the land, but those cursed by him shall be cut off. Those who are cursed by God will be cut off. In other words, the one that God curses will die. You say, God puts curses on people? Well, God doesn't curse people for any reason other than sin. The Bible says that the curse of sin is death. So yes, if you go through life sinning and you never repent and you never find forgiveness through Jesus Christ, yes, you will endure the curse of sin. Verse 23. The steps of a man are from the Lord and he establishes him in whose way he delights. The steps of the man are from the Lord. Now, people have a free will, and they can do what they want. But even though people have a free will, and therefore are responsible for what they do, God still sovereignly works behind the scenes. Which means, in the end, God uses bad choices to work together to bring about his big plan and doesn't eliminate man's free will but somehow it works in conjunction with God's sovereignty verse 24 though he fall well, let's read the last part of verse 23 and he establishes him in whose way he delights though he fall he shall not be cast headlong for the Lord is the stay of his hand a good person may fall or even get knocked down spiritually speaking but he's not going to stay down not if he knows the Lord God pulls his people up and keeps them going setbacks do not destroy God's people 25 I have been young and now I am old yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging bread don't take this as a promise because it isn't I have, I have seen some very sloppy biblical interpretation where they take this which is poetry which is like a parable which is a general truth and they turn it into a promise it's not a promise from God the fact is sometimes godly people do go hungry and so this is not a promise the apostle Paul knew what it was like to be hungry so it's not what this is talking about it simply means that God doesn't forsake those who love him. And now it may seem like he does, judging from their outward circumstances, but he does not. 26. He is ever giving liberally and lending, and his children become a blessing. The children of godly people, more often than not, are a blessing. It's because they've been raised right. 
The children of the wicked, on the other hand, are often miserable to be around, just like their parents. They're disrespectful and a nuisance, just like their parents. What else would you expect? 27. Depart from evil and do good, so shall you abide forever. People who do not do good will experience evil. And that's why God says, turn your back on evil. Depart from evil. Walk away from it, because you're not going to experience any good if you don't. Turn your back on evil. Walk away from it. Don't make a treaty with it. Don't compromise with it. Slam the door in the face of evil and turn away from it. 28. For the Lord loves justice. He will not forsake his saints. God will never leave his saints. He never leaves his people. Never. Now, you may want to be around some people. Then they don't want to be around you. You may want to be married to somebody. They don't want to be married to you. You may want to be friends with somebody. And they may not want to be friends with you. That sometimes happens. But God never says no to someone who wants to be with him. Never. The last part of verse 28. The righteous shall be preserved forever. But the children of the wicked shall be cut off. The children of the wicked refers to people who love wickedness. They are children of the wicked. And they will be cut off. In other words, they will perish. People who love wickedness do not have eternal life in them. It's not that saved people don't do anything wrong. It's that saved people don't turn their back on God and live in absolute rebellion against God and love wickedness. 1 John 5.18 29 The righteous shall possess the land and dwell upon it forever. The Israelite righteous, you know, they were promised the promised land if they remained faithful to God. The land for us Christians would refer to our inheritance in Christ which would include our raised bodies on the new earth and uh, just good times forever. So the righteous will enjoy paradise forever. That is what this is saying. 30. The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom and his tongue speaks justice. The law of his God is in his heart. His steps do not slip. Boy, just zero in on verse 30. The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom. That is why the best place for a man of God to go for counsel is a godly man. And the best place for a woman to go for counsel is a godly woman. That's the best. That's the idea set up. And that's because a godly man, godly woman, they will speak the truth in love and they know right from wrong. They have wisdom and they utter wisdom. Verse 32. <clears throat> The wicked watches the righteous and seeks to slay him. Hatred. There it is again, that hatred that wicked people have for God's people. You know, if it wasn't for the grace of God and his wisdom in establishing civil government to protect the innocent, if it wasn't for that, good people would be slaughtered by evil people. It wouldn't be long. Notice verse 32 again, and then verse 33. The wicked watches the righteous and seeks to slay him. The Lord will not abandon him to his power, or let him be condemned when he is brought to trial. God delivers his people. If not their bodies in this life, then for sure their souls in the next life. 34. Wait for the Lord and keep to his way and he will exalt you to possess the land. You will look on the destruction of the wicked. In other words, don't be impatient with God. Wait for the Lord. Keep his way. Don't be impatient with God. Just keep doing the right thing. Keep putting him first. And at the right time, those who have wronged you and just the wrong things that have happened to you in general, those, those things are going to be taken care of. 
and those who wronged you will be exposed and your righteousness will be vindicated and it will be rewarded but just don't give up don't quit walking with the Lord <clears throat> verse 35 I have seen a wicked man overbearing and towering like a cedar of Lebanon David's been around he's seen all sorts of bad things David does not have an idealistic view of the world he's no ivory tower preacher who never lived in the real world and he's no ivory tower king either who never lived in the real world he's been around he's experienced all sorts of things he has seen people in positions of authority treating others like dirt in fact he's been a victim of people in authority who have been very bad people and have treated him like dirt so he's seen that kind of stuff and so has God verse 36 notice this though again I passed by and lo he was no more though I sought him he could not be found and so yeah he has seen horrible people do terrible things to those that they have authority over but then he says you know then one day I looked and that big tough mean fellow was gone oh he was a big deal for a while but now he is nothing and that's the way it always goes sooner or later that's what happens and because that always happens sooner or later that is one of the reasons we can be patient with God and we can live for him and know that he is just and everything will be taken care of 37 mark the blameless man and behold the upright for there is posterity for the man of peace in other words there's a good future a great future for a good person who knows the Lord a very happy ending for those who know Christ 38 but transgressors shall be altogether destroyed the posterity of the wicked shall be cut off to be cut off means to have your time shortened the posterity of the of the wicked shall be cut off the good times of the wicked shall be cut off the happiness and the hope of the wicked will be cut off shortened by their sin and no future to look forward to that's what it means to be cut off because they will go to hell and hell is the absence of everything good hell is the absence of everything that would make one happy and it is the presence of everything that is evil and it will never end so the happiness of the wicked will be cut off when they are in hell there will be no more happiness you think of hell you know hell is the presence of everything evil it is the absence of anything good so think of, make a list of you know a thousand things that you call good and check them off one by one because if you go to hell you're not going to experience any of them a smile that's a good thing won't be there uh, painless existence won't be there uh, lack of thirst won't be there friends you like friends that's a good thing won't be there family members that's a good thing won't be there good times won't be there beauty won't be there pleasant sounds won't be there pleasure won't be there um, restfulness won't be there y you name it anything good that you can think of write it down and scratch it out because it's not going to be there good food won't be there and go on and on and on verse 39 the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord God saves the righteous in other words God saves the godly the ungodly those who have turned their back on God willfully and remain in that state they are not saved it's not salvation by works salvation is by grace not works but the wicked are not saved verse 39 the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord he is their refuge in the time of trouble the Lord helps them and delivers them 
He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in Him. The salvation here would include deliverance from eternal salvation, but clearly it's not limited to that. Any deliverance from any trouble, whether spiritual or physical, whether big or small, is the work of God's grace. Salvation is always the work of God's grace. It's always a gift from God, even when the gift is in the form of opportunities to do the correct thing and to avoid trouble. It's still God's grace. It's still a gift. Psalm 38, verse 1, O Lord, rebuke me not in thy anger, nor chasten me in thy wrath. I can't think of anything worse than to have God angry at me and to have God rebuke me when he is angry. That just you know, causes David to shudder. Now, a godly person will understand and will accept the loving rebuke of God when they sin. That's to be expected. But it is a horrifying thought, and it should scare anyone to death if they believe that God is actually angry at them and will punish them in his anger. 2. For thy arrows have sunk into me, and thy hand has come, up, come down on me, now, there was some physical discipline from God for his sin. And we're going to look at that in a minute. But also the spiritual pain David feels after his sin is probably worse than anything. I say that because the guilt and the sadness over offending God is something that is very tough on God's people. 3. There is no soundness in my flesh because of thy indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin. A sick spirit, you see, often makes a sick body because they are connected. I'm not saying all sickness is a result of sin. I'm saying sin will result in negative effects on the body. And a soul that has been defiled by willful sin will in some manner weaken the physical body. And that is what David is experiencing. And he goes on. Look at verse 4. For my iniquities have gone over my head. They weigh like a burden too heavy for me. He saw himself. He saw his sinful self. And it was an ugly sight. It's a horrifying thing to see yourself as you really are. You know, in, in darkness, a dirty face looks very clean. But you snap on the bathroom light and you see every bit of dirt on your face and it's the same in the spiritual realm spiritually spiritually dull sinners feel pretty good about themselves because they don't see their sin they're measuring themselves against other sinners maybe or something and, and so they feel pretty good they seem pretty clean but boy when their conscience is awakened by the Holy Spirit and the word of God like David's then it's a horrifying sight because they can see that their iniquities are actually over their head and they know they're in big trouble. That's when you need a Savior. Verse 5, My wounds grow foul and fester because of my foolishness. See? This is an awful picture of physical disease that came on him because of his sin. Foul and fester. But that also reflects the condition of a soul that has sinned. And, and that has been battered by guilt. See, there it is again. Man sees his true, despicable, horrible self whenever the Holy Spirit awakens his conscience to his sin through the Word of God. 6. I am utterly bowed down and prostrate all the day I go about mourning. The horrible spiritual and mental price for sin brought on by the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. That is what David is describing. <clears throat> and it doesn't get any more miserable than a child of God living with unconfessed sin. 7. For my loins are filled with burning and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am utterly spent and crushed. I groan because of the tumult of my heart. <clears throat> Excuse me. David is experiencing some type of deep inflammation 
is a burning in his skin. <clears throat> so he's experiencing this bad. And he also perceives that that physical pain is actually punishment for his sin. <clears throat> and we're reminded once again that God's gift of salvation pays for the eternal suffering of sin but it does not pay for the temporal suffering of sin. 9. Lord, all my longing is known to thee. My sign is not hidden from thee. God knew how David longed for his good health to return. God is not unaware of any of our longings. 10. My heart throbs, my strength fails me, and the light of my eyes it also has gone from me. David's heart is racing. And he says that he's going blind. So his strength, both his physical strength and his spiritual strength, it is draining fast. This is all a result of his sin. 11. My friends and companions stand aloft from my plague, and my kinsmen stand afar off. So in addition to his physical <coughs> and spiritual suffering David is also alone and as a result he's feeling lonely and there's a reason for that no one can share in the personal spiritual torment of a soul who has sinned against God that's something you got to carry by yourself no one even if they wanted to could help whether it's in this life or the next life you suffer for your sin in eternity and hell there isn't anybody no matter how much they would want to help you that could help you you're suffering alone verse 12 those who seek my life lay their snares those who seek my hurt speak of ruin and meditate treachery all the day long David's enemies were plotting against him the Bible says that if a person's ways are pleasing to God and God makes even his enemies to be at peace with him but the opposite is true also God raises up enemies for a person whose ways are not pleasing to God it's happening to David it happened to his son Saul or so Solomon well Solomon when he was a godly man at first everything went well everybody respected him they were in awe of him but when he turned his back against God God raised up enemies to harass him and it continued on to the other offspring of David as well just the way it goes 13 but I am like a deaf man I do not hear like a dumb man who does not open his mouth yea I am like a man who does not hear and in whose mouth are no rebukes in other words David really he was deaf to the slanders and the threats. In other words, he didn't respond to them. He didn't try to get back. You know, and that's good because it takes more courage and faith to remain silent when attacked than it does to defend yourself. Sometimes the wisest thing to do is to remain silent. Because if you're being slandered, all you're going to do is give them more ammunition sometimes the best thing to do is just to remain silent and wait for God to bring the truth out at the right time and it takes faith because sometimes it takes a long time 15 but for thee O Lord do I wait it is thou O Lord my God who will answer see when you know that God is a righteous judge as David knew you can let God deal with those who slander you you can be patient you can be silent and you can know that when the time is right God will take care of business he will take care of those who treat you unfairly because he is just just as he chastens his children you can be sure of that too God is very consistent about these things 16 for I pray only let them not rejoice over me who boast against me when my foot slips waiting and trusting God doesn't mean you don't pray David prayed that 
God would put an end to the arrogance of those who slandered him. You're going through hard times. I mean, that's one thing we should do is pray. Prayer is the one response we should have to anyone who gives us a hard time and to just hard times in general. 17. For I am ready to fall and my pain is ever with me. It is a spiritual battle for even the godliest person. It's a spiritual battle. And that's what David is going through here. He says he's ready to fall. That's falling spiritually. He knows he's on the edge. And the fact is, we are all potentially on the verge of sin all the time. That's why it is so important to keep up our spiritual guard, to keep ourselves strong spiritually through the Word of God and through prayer. 18. I confess my iniquity. I am sorry for my sin. And always remember, if we confess our sins, and we are truly sorry for what we've done, God will forgive. It does not matter what the sin may be. God will forgive. It took a lot to bring David to this point. A lot of pain, physical suffering, spiritual anguish. But he got to the point where he confessed his sin, and sometimes people don't get to that point, and they do suffer an awful lot. But just remember, you get to that point, you confess, God is there, he forgives. Verse 19. Those who are my foes without cause are mighty, and many are those who hate me wrongfully. Something to remember. You will always be outnumbered by your spiritual enemies. Always. Don't let that shock you. It's natural. If you are a righteous person who is living for God, you will always be outnumbered by your spiritual enemies. Many are those who hate me wrongfully, says David. That's because the way of sin is very popular in the world. The way of lying, cheating, stealing, compromise, whatever. It's very popular with the world. And so Jesus says, Woe unto you when all men speak well of you. 20. Those who render me evil for good are my adversaries because I follow after good. And there it is again. There's going to be more who will dislike you for speaking the truth and living godly than those who will stand by you for speaking the truth and living godly. And to be honest with you, the worst thing that you can possibly do is seek to be liked by worthless sinners who care nothing for truth and care nothing for holiness. 21. Do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, be not far from me. And God doesn't forsake those who want to be close to Him. God does not take off on His faithful ones when they need Him. Here's the thing to remember. Yes, you may be unpopular for doing what is right and saying what is right, but God will always be there for you. And fellowshipping with Him will give you courage to persevere another hour or another day if you seek that fellowship. 22. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. Now, David finishes this prayer with a fervent request. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. And You know, we see once again one of the immediate positive results of trouble. Nobody likes trouble. Everybody hates trouble. But one of the immediate positive results of trouble is fervent prayer. And we see it in David. Guys, people don't pray fervently Good people pray, and good people pray fervently. But I don't think anybody prays as fervently when everything is going well as what they do when things are not going well. Trouble has a way of giving new life to stale prayers. This is amazing, but it makes God's people more eager for God. And it makes people who don't belong to God oftentimes interested in God. So, the suffering is a mystery, and yet there are clear results.